It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So high by now, anything's possible. Oh, my mama. Oh, my mama made it, ma. Anything's possible. Rainy J's back with the vengeance. Back. All the real Celtics fans in attendance. Ooh. It's the truth like 34. Yeah. It's like walking in the garden when you hear the roars. The crowd goes crazy. Most in-depth coverage on the daily. Mainly podcast royalty. The content kings. When you talking about the franchise with 17 rings. Focus like Danny at the deadline. Global with it. Got a local feel like the red line. The blue line. The green line. Play it in between time. I'ma throw my C's jersey on in the meantime. And press play. When the F's done, I can't wait until the next day. Trying to stay in tune with the C's. It's the best way. Melly. Hey there, welcome back to the Lockdown Celtics podcast. I want to thank you for making this show part of your daily routine, whatever it is that you're doing right now in this moment, wherever you're going, however it is that you're listening to the show or watching the show on YouTube, I want to say thank you for making this show and me part of that routine. I'm John Corrales. I cover the Boston Celtics for Boston Sports Journal. I am also the author of the Boston Celtics All-Time All-Stars a book that I used to have right here handy that I could show you on YouTube, but for some reason I've put that away. Maybe it's, I put it on display because I signed it. I signed another copy today, putting those out in the mail. You can order that book that if you're watching, I'm pointing to directly behind me over my left shoulder, the Boston Celtics all-time all-stars on my website, johncorrales.com. For only $30, that includes the cost of shipping. You can get a signed copy that you can give to your friend, your loved one, Whomever, signed copy, Father's Day is coming up. It's a great gift for the father who is also a Celtics fan. Today on the on the uh, podcast, the Celtics, obviously this is the Tuesday show, Tuesday night, Celtics uh, Nets game two. And I will go over some of the stuff that came out of, of practice. Not a whole lot came out of practice on Monday because everybody's going to keep things pretty tight. But uh, some things. And then in the second segment, I'll go over some of the Nets adjustments, if there are any, what do I think they are going to do? And then segment three, just how this little sense of normalcy is helping the Celtics, everybody really. And uh, you'll hear uh, Brad Stevens had an interesting answer to my question about normalcy. This show is brought to you by rockauto.com. Amazing selection, reliably low prices. All the parts your car will ever need, visit rockauto.com and tell them Locked On sent you. So Boston Celtics practiced on Monday in Brooklyn. They had no one new on the injury report, so that's good. Just Jalen Brown, he's just going to be on the injury report because his season is over with the wrist surgery. But, by the way, Jalen Brown's still with the team. That's pretty good. You saw him on the on the broadcast. He's got the cast on, but he's out there. He's active. He's he's you know yelling out support, yelling out things. like he, He's kind of helping out. So uh, great, great to see him there with the, uh, you know, with the team. He wants to be there. That's great. Uh, Robert Williams, not on the injury report, not one of those game time decisions, although he sort of probably is a game time decision. But Brad Stevens said he dressed and went through kind of the walkthrough portion of practice, didn't go through some of the active drills. They're keeping him off of his feet, but he's not on the injury report. So the anticipation is, that unless something goes terribly wrong overnight, that he's just going to deal with it and he's going to go. Now, what does that mean for starting, not starting? That'll be an interesting adjustment to see if Brad Stevens just says, we're going to start with our best unit. And even though we might not be able to play Robert Williams as much, we're going to go with it. We're going to say, we're going to start with him and however long he can tolerate it, then we're going to go a different direction. The question is then, do they? what direction do they go? It'll probably be Tristan Thompson, but I'm kind of curious to see if the Celtics go a different route with their backup center. And it may depend on what Brooklyn does. And that's something I'm going to get into in the next segment. But part of, part of that discussion is, what does Brooklyn do with its five? And if they start Jeff Green... You can start Robert Williams, and if they start Jeff Green, then that, I, I'm I'm okay with that. But who do you sub in? Who does Brooklyn sub in? 
So that's going to be something to watch for uh, at least the beginning of game two, some of that back and forth between Steve Nash and Brad Stevens. The bigger story, and we talked a little bit to Evan Fournier after the practice, is how do the Celtics get going? And Evan Fournier was asked a couple of questions about this and basically said, quote, it's all on me. I have to do a better job finding my rhythm, finding my opportunities within the offense, within the flow of the offense, maybe more active on the boards so that we can push the ball in transition, just find ways to help. So he knows, he knows that he needs to do more. Like I've said before, and I've written on Boston Sports Journal, three for 10 from the field is just not going to get it done. Three for 10 is, is, first of all, the three is terrible. Can't just have three makes from Evan Fournier in a game. And secondly, the 10 might be worse because you need Evan Fournier to be aggressive. So how do you get Evan Fournier to be aggressive? I'm trying to piece together some of these things. Brad Stevens said the other day after the game, we're going to rely on corporate knowledge, maybe dig into the past to find ways to attack them better. So what corporate knowledge, what, what in the past can the Celtics do? I think that we might see a couple of old Gordon Hayward plays, and this might be a great opportunity to run Fournier as the primary ball handler and start Tatum and Kemba in a different position off the ball and have them all kind of interact and play together. So one thing I like to do, it's a common play, but the Celtics used it a ton with Gordon Hayward. I would not be surprised to see what, what's called a, a horn set, which is something I've talked about in the past. Uh, I did a video on my, my personal YouTube channel years ago about the horn set. Um, it's called the horn set because it starts off with guys on each elbow it's just like two horns, right? And they usually see the the hook'em horns kind of logo, like that. That that's that's the hand signal. You might see a little horns in there. And what happens is Evan Fournier starts with the ball, and Tatum, Kemba Walker, maybe somebody else. One of those guys starts at one elbow, and the other starts at the other elbow. Now you can run this with Fournier as the ball handler, and he you can run a ton, a ton of different actions off of horns. And it's, it's like I said, it's a very common play that the Celtics have used that every basketball team, basically every basketball team has some version of a horn set in their playbook somewhere. And, and why I like it and why I like it for this scenario is because you've got those three guys, you can have any number of screens set screens, Across, you can dump it in. Fournier can dump it in to Jason Tatum and run off of him for a handoff. You can dump it into Tatum, and Tatum can get a screen, a cross screen, and he could he can do any number of things. You can run, uh, you can run what's known as an elevator screen for a guy coming up. Fournier can go off the ball. Those two guys can screen for whomever. Maybe you don't. Maybe you start Kemba in the corner and you can run an elevator screen. It's called elevator doors because the two guys kind of close behind you. Know, they, they kind of put their shoulders together and the guy runs through the screen. You can do any number of things and you don't even have to start Fournier with the ball in his hand. But why I, I think starting the ball, starting with the ball in his hand, it automatically gets him engaged more aggressive. So I think the Celtics can turn to something like that and run a variety of things. And, and what they run off of that can be just the function of who's on the floor. How is Brooklyn playing? Are they switching? Are they still switching? What are they doing? So, uh, but that that's my guess. My guess is more of that that involves Fournier. Now you can start with Fournier and the ball. You can start him as one of the horns on either elbow. He can, he can be a guy that starts off in the corner and you can run that elevator screen. If you start off with Tristan Thompson or another big up top and you run your, you know, your four and five out there, you start with maybe smart is one of the guys that's on the horns and you set that elevator door screen for Fournier coming up to get the ball. That's another option. Ways to involve him in that initial action, take advantage of those 
those screens. That's what I'm looking for. So get Fournier going, dip into the Gordon Hayward playbook and see what we can get. I think the Gordon Hayward playbook is the right playbook for Fournier. And I think that's going to get us to a place where at least he's going to be more involved. They got to get him more involved. Three of 10 is not going to cut it. If they can get him shooting 15, 16, 17 shots and feeling comfortable doing it, then there's a strong chance the Celtics can, can actually be in position to steal one. Will they steal one? I don't know. Brooklyn's very good. They're pretty damn good. But you, you need Fournier and you need Kemba. And you can run this. The best part about this set is if you're involving all three of those guys, Tatum, Kemba, and Fournier, they're just going to play off of each other. There's going to be opportunities for all of those guys. So that's something that I think that we should watch for from the Celtics. What should we watch for from Brooklyn? I'm going to talk about that when I come back. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients, Lucy has created a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. Lucy also has a lozenge with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, cherry ice, citrus, and mint. Lucy lozenges and, gu and gums are FSA and HSA eligible, so you can use your FSA cards to purchase Lucy, and now it's convenient and discreet. Products can be shipped and enjoyed anywhere. You can have them on flights, at work, on the go, even in the gym if you need to. Now, I grew up in a smoking household. It would have been great to have my dad switch to something like Lucy instead of smoking his cigarettes. That <laughs> would have made things a lot more pleasant around the house, for sure. It's 2021. Get rid of your cig cigarettes. Unplug your vape. Throw out your dip. Get Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month, and it is so simple that you don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. They are FSA and HSA eligible. Remember that so you can spend pre-tax dollars on them. Locked on NBA Network listeners, go to lucy.co and use the promo code Locked on NBA to get 20% off all products on your first order, including gum or lozenges. That's Lucy. Dot com, dot co, lucy.co, and use the promo code locked on NBA at checkout. I have to give you this disclaimer warning this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Lucy.co, be sure to use that promo code locked on NBA. Rock Auto is the place to go now that you need things for your car. You've come out of a, a tough winter and you've got. Nicks, chips, whatever you want to fix something on your car. Maybe it's, you know, it's pothole season. Maybe you need to get something to repair whatever damage has been done to your car from a pothole. So go to rockauto.com, make that your first stop because there's a really good chance that you're going to save money over wherever it is that you are going to go instead of rockauto.com. Don't go to one of those strip malls. Don't go to one of those chain stores. You're just going to get somebody who's behind the counter that's going to enter all that same information into their computer that you can enter into yours at home. Go in, check out their, their, their catalog at rockauto.com. It's very easy to, to use with drop-down menus that are very easy to navigate. You'll find out that these prices are so reliably low, it's going to be shocking in some cases. Uh, chain stores have different price tiers for the pros as, as opposed to do it yourselfers, which is ridiculous. They change their, their prices sometimes based on what the market will bear, which is just also ridiculous. Rockauto.com is a family business has been doing this forever. 20 plus years. They're going to take care of you no matter how complicated, no matter how simple you need wipers, you need a piece for your engine. You need anything in between rockauto.com. When you go, you're probably going to buy something because those prices are so low. When you check out, write locked on in there, how did you hear about us box? That's how they know we sent you. Write locked on in there, how did you hear about us box? It's an amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. And make sure you're following the Locked On NBA podcast as well because I'm going to be on there with Jake Madison for the Wednesday 
podcast. So you've got Locked On Celtics coming up post game Wednesday uh, after the Celtics and the Nets, and then I will be on the Wednesday Locked On NBA to talk about the other two games as well, as well as more about the Celtics there. So make sure you're subscribed. I talked about what the Celtics can do differently. I touched on a little bit of what the Nets can do differently. I'm not sure exactly what major adjustments they're going to make. This is a case, and I I talked about this with Adam Arbrecht of Locked On Nets when we did our crossover the other day, last week. And I said, what what are Brooklyn's adjustments going to be? How about some more James Harden? How about some more Kevin Durant? A little more Kyrie Irving. Like, Keep doing what you're doing. I think if I'm the Nets, I come out of that and I say, you won that game by nine, and it was only because Kemba hit a couple of late threes. Kemba was way off. You played good defense. You were cold as hell in the first half, and you still had a lead that got up to 15 quick. You took Boston's best shot in the first half. Boston defended really well, generally speaking. And you still turned it on real quick and you got up to 15. So if I'm looking at it from the Brooklyn perspective, and I'm sure if you listen to the Locked On Nets podcast and and you read some of the things that are going on, uh, you know, written by some of the Brooklyn Brooklyn side of of the, the reporting world, I'm willing to bet the general consensus is, you know what, keep doing what you're doing and you'll be fine. And that's probably true. If we're being completely honest, like that's probably true. However, you never know. Boston, like just like they can say, hey, you know, we were cold in the first half. Well, Boston can say, hey, you know, we got nothing practically from Kemba and nothing from Evan Fournier. Like those guys, we're counting on those guys. Like they probably won't be this bad the whole series. You hope they're not. So Boston can still say some things too. Boston will make adjustments. They've been a pretty good offensive team all year long. Uh, They have had that ability to go out there and put up a lot of points. So Brooklyn can stand pat and say, let's see what they do. But they can also make some adjustments. Uh, I think defensively, they're still going to say, let's keep switching. And I think they switch out of necessity. They're not going to try anything super, super complicated defensively. This team is is still new playing together, right? They are they are still trying to figure things out. That that lineup that they put out the fir- to start the first game had never played a minute of of NBA basketball together. So they can't go in and put in super complicated defensive concepts. This is going to be simple because they they're just not a, a defensive team anyway. They've got those individual defenders, and the Celtics are going to make those guys move. But they're going to say, hey, look, let's see what the Celtics do. Let's go with our switching, and let's see if our switching can just keep up with that. All right? Let's be aware that they're going to try and slip screens. Let's be aware that they're going to do X, Y, and Z. Let's be aware of certain things here and just make sure that our switches are tight. Make sure that there's some help behind that. Make sure that if you're on the weak side, you've got a step, you know, you've got a foot in the paint. And so you can close out. You're not trying to get the steal necessarily. You're just trying to close out, but be there in the paint to give that help, to deter the slip. You know, so your, your, your focus, I think from Steve Nash's perspective is keep doing what we're doing, tighten it up a little bit, make sure the help is there. The counter to that is if Boston is getting them out of sorts, if the things that I've talked about today with Fournier and yesterday with the slips and the rescreens and all of that, if that stuff is actually having the effect that it's supposed to have from Boston's perspective, then I can see Brooklyn saying, you know what, zone it up and we're going to go zone and let's, let's see how they do against the zone. Boston is kind of notorious for not playing well against the zone. So let's throw some of that stuff out there. Again, they haven't done this a lot, but look, playing a zone is, you should be able to to, to figure out how to play a zone. If you've ever played basketball, you know the basic concept of a zone. Now, NBA zones are different. They're more complicated, but you can get the basics down of a 2-3 zone, a matchup zone, 3-2 zone. 
you can come up with different variations. You, you at least get the basics there. So, and they've, they've run zone before. So I, I would expect that if Brooklyn's going to change anything, it'll be more zone defense. And if, if Steve Nash wants to get saucy, <laughs> then he can start out in a zone and say, ha, gotcha, threw you off. You were expecting switches. Here's a zone. That could be enough in the first quarter to have Boston come out and be like, oh, whoa, whoa, we were expecting switches and in, in kind of fall out of sorts. Now, the thing I said before is they could also start Jeff Green and go really small. Boston targeted Blake Griffin. He was not good in that game. Maybe they say, you know what? Start Jeff Green from the beginning. Let's go small. We're going to switch every, every, everything and then force you to adjust. And how does Brad Stevens adjust to that? Again, I said it before, if they start Robert Williams, that's fine because Jeff Green guarding Robert Williams, I'll take that because whoever switches onto Robert Williams, he's just going to dive to the basket. That could be a lob or it could be fouls and you can get Brooklyn into early foul trouble. That would be a huge, huge help. If you can find a way to draw those early fouls and get Brooklyn into the bonus, now you can you have the opportunity to score points and really pile up the points. Maybe you can get one of their key guys out for a little while. Maybe throw them off a rhythm, a Harden, a, a Durant, you know, one of those guys. If you can get two fouls on those guys, whew, I mean, that, that's a huge, that would be a huge plus. So force them to defend. And if they want to throw Jeff Green out there and you got Robert Williams out there, that's, that's how I would, even if they put Jeff Green in, it's Robert Williams with, with Jeff Green to me. Whatever they're going to do. Now, on the other side, you got to be aware. And another reason why I want Robert Williams in there when Jeff Green is is out there is because you're going to need somebody who's able to recover quickly. And even though Jeff Green's going to space the floor, he's seen Robert Williams block three-point shots. And when, when Robert Williams is on the floor, wh- whoever is driving, unless it's like Durant probably <laughs> – But generally, whoever is driving and you know Robert Williams is on the floor, it's like swimming when you know that there's a shark in the water. You're like, where is it? Get me out of here. I don't want to be in here. So that, I think, has that can can counter the Jeff Green effect a little bit. So if they do go with Jeff Green, I'm going with Robert Williams. I'm doing it as much as I can. I'm not putting Tristan Thompson up there against Jeff Green. I'll, I'll put Tristan Thompson in against Blake or any other of their big guys. Uh, and then if if Claxton's in there and he's he's trying to protect the rim, maybe they go small. Maybe the Celtics put in a, you know, try Grant Williams. Maybe you just roll the dice on five minutes of Grant Williams and you see what kind of Grant Williams you, that you've got. It's dicey. That's a, it's a tough proposition because if you've got, and it wouldn't even be five minutes. It'd be like two or three, but those two or three minutes can be disastrous. And that's tough. That's why I hesitate. He's had such a tough time but I think with him versus Tristan Thompson spacing the floor, pulling Claxton out, like that at least opens up some lanes and gets somebody, uh, get, gets Jason Tatum, Fournier, Kemba to the rim a little bit. So we'll see. I, I, I don't think the Nets do a ton differently. I, I think they just roll with it and they have a couple of these counters, like I mentioned, to throw at the Celtics to, um, try to throw them off a little bit, but I just don't think it's that much. Up next, normalcy and how normalcy is actually helping these guys feel a little bit better. Maybe it's helping the Celtics a little bit. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action. Baseball season, sure, go bet on baseball. It's in full swing. Obviously, you got the NBA playoffs. Great opportunities to bet there. You can. Uh, Bet in-game action. You can see what's going on at halftime and bet some of the props that are are coming up in in the second half. NHL playoffs are here. You can bet on UFC, MMA, stuff going on around the world. It's all there on Bet Online. Head on over on your laptop or mobile device to check out all the great sports news, sign-up bonuses, and contest information. Use that promo code LOCKEDON for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. 
Locked On gets you a 50% welcome bonus. If your first deposit is $100, you'll get a $50 welcome bonus. If it's $200, it's a $100 welcome bonus. That's what you get. That's how it works. 50% welcome bonus with the promo code Locked On. So don't sit on the sidelines anymore. This is your chance to get into the game as your team makes its playoff run. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Please gamble responsibly. Game one was a, a return to some level of normalcy for the Boston Celtics. They had time to prepare. They had some practice time. They didn't have to fly all over the place. They played in front of basically a full house. They were at 75% capacity in Brooklyn. So that's that's loud enough. That's that's enough people to make it you know, feel like a full house. And so I asked Brad Stevens about a little bit of a return to basketball normalcy. I've talked a lot about how practice time and rest and all of that stuff has helped the Celtics get back to at least playing some decent basketball here. They, they played pretty well for a lot of that game one. And I think they played with a, a renewed energy. They weren't any sort of uh, lethargic. They, they certainly made plenty of mistakes and, and they had their, their faults. And I'm not saying that they played, you know, particularly great basketball, but better and better energy. And all of those other things kind of factored into that. What I never mentioned until now is how getting back to normal just feels for them. Just getting out into a crowd. And as Brad Stevens said, I think we would all prefer, even on the road, playing in front of 18,000 or 15,000 or whatever it is. And you look at Trey Young in Madison Square Garden the day before. Almost full house in Madison Square Garden. Trey Young hits that floater to beat the Knicks and quiet the crowd down. And that's something, that scene was not possible prior to the past couple of weeks. That scene certainly wasn't possible in the bubble. There were no fans to look at. And there's some extra juice to that. The guys obviously love playing off of that stuff. There is nothing like playing in front of a big crowd. Now, I haven't played in front of a crowd of 18,000 people. The most I've ever played out in front of was a few thousand. And even that, when you're in a building, and obviously I played in much, much smaller arenas, but when you're in a building and you've got a bunch of people kind of screaming at you from the other side, that Trey Young moment, shutting up a crowd is the best. Road silence is almost better than home cheers in a lot of ways because they're supposed to cheer for you at home. When, when you shut up the home crowd, that silence is just so beautiful. And that, to me, that getting that silence from like the loud roar down to that silence is awesome. So the Celtics looking up at that crowd in Brooklyn and trying to shut them up after you make a, a big play and you look into the crowd and you just hear that, that hush, it's like, oh, that's right. That's right. And that gives you a little boost. Now, obviously, when you're playing at home and the crowd's going nuts and, and just like these guys for the Nets, when those guys do something great and the crowd's roaring and you look up and you're, you know, popping your jersey and you're looking into the crowd and you just see all of that, you feel all of that adoration, there's an adrenaline boost off of that. So all of these guys playing to some degree of normalcy helps them. It even it, it's wild because when Brad says, uh, and it's not in this quote, but he talks about, uh, oh yeah, no, he does. He says it right there in the about the mask. Uh, that you take the mask off, and it's easier to communicate. Was that in that quote? Because he says it afterwards. Um, it's actually easier to communicate with the guys in a packed arena without the mask on than a quiet arena with the mask on. It just that. There's something about that feeling of being in that moment that just makes everything better. 
even if you have to yell to your guys that, you know, whatever play is coming up next, it's actually still easier to do that for Brad Stevens. I don't think we should discount that. Now, Tristan Thompson called out the Massachusetts governor. And I think, I don't think that he knew that they were getting a full, full boat of fans on, uh, what is it? With a game four. So, or he's lobbying to get more fans in for game three. That's the big question. I think do the Celtics get more fans in for game three? I, I look, I'm, I'm very cautious about COVID-19. I don't know what the regulations are, but at this point, if you're lifting the restrictions at midnight, I don't know what the difference between 8 PM and midnight does for the virus. So if you're going to put people in there a few hours, like, like if at midnight, if the Bruins, I don't know what their, what their schedule is going to be, but if the Bruins get to have the full capacity that next night, then I don't know why that day before the Celtics can't do it, but that's up to the governor and that's up to the team. And I, I don't know, maybe there's a reason if there's a reason for that, then I'm I'll back down on that. I'm not pushing that hard for it in the first place, but to get a crowd in there, to get these guys feeling like, like normal. And Brad says it, it, it's not like this is, you know, there, there are millions of people who have gone through exponentially worse. Like I'm not trying to make this on a human level, what, what they've gone through, but from a basketball level, just from an NBA level, they've gone through a lot. And to finally be able to be like, you know what, this is how I, this is why I love playing in the NBA and, and getting that little extra pep that all helps. It all helps. So that's part of the reason why these guys are playing better. And hopefully they play well enough to win game two and send it back to a game three with more than 5,000 people in the stands. Maybe you can get 10,000 people in the stands or 15. Uh, capacity is what, 19 and change? We'll see what they do for game three. And if the Celtics have a chance to play in front of a home crowd and a chance to defend home court. I will be talking about it. I will be here after the game. Like I said before, I'll be podcasting uh, after I'm done with my Boston Sports Journal duties. And then I will be podcasting on the Lockdown NBA after the late games. And so lots of basketball tomorrow. Make sure you're subscribed to both shows. Subscribe to this show if you're new. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. YouTube channel is great because if you're at work and you can't pop on your phone or whatever, Obviously, you, if you want to listen to it, if you want to listen to part of it, you can head on over to YouTube. If you have the opportunity to put headphones on at your desk, then have that YouTube playing in the background and you can listen to the show. It's going to be there. So subscribe to the YouTube show uh, and share it. Tell your friends that they should be listening to the Lockdown Celtics podcast here on the Lockdown Podcast Network.